are coming on the air tonight with severe weather on two fronts. The West Coast tonight bracing for a powerful storm to hit. And on the East, clean up after deadly wet and windy conditions. We're going to give you the outlook on when things could get better and the holiday travel impact. Plus, Target tonight blaming a crime wave for a bunch of store closings. What a new CNBC investigation tells us about why those shutdowns may not be a solution to fighting theft and how toilet water could end up coming out of your kitchen sink. If you live in California as part of a push to get reliable drinking water to people while they deal with extreme droughts, we're going to explain. Uh, then young conservatives weigh in on the Republican slate of candidates, what they're saying about feminism, 2020, and January 6th. Some of it may surprise you. Plus, how does a major studio move forward after dumping one of its biggest actors, what the future of Marvel and all its upcoming projects could look like now that they've split with actor Jonathan Majors following his assault conviction. Hey everybody, I'm Yasmin in for Hallie Jackson, who's on assignment in Israel. Tonight, as the West Coast is prepping for a storm to hit the East Coast, it's cleaning up after a wet and windy, deadly and disastrous storm. Communities just totally underwater. And the concern, it's not over. Several rivers are in major flood stage, one town telling people to evacuate immediately. And tonight we know this storm took the lives of at least five people just yesterday from either fallen trees or swept away in floodwaters. Those factors are still in play today as floods make it difficult for both rescue crews and people to get where they need to go. In New Jersey, firefighters were not able to stop a fire at this home because of the flooding. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. And because of those fallen trees that took out power lines, nearly 450,000 people are still in the dark tonight for over 24 hours in lots of places. Maine's governor declaring a state of emergency for several counties. And now Mother Nature has her eyes set on the West Coast with storms about to bring rain and snow to the Golden State. It's put more than 20 million people under flood watches as the holiday is approaching. The busiest days for travel just days away, more than two and a half million people expected to go through the airport on Thursday. We have meteorologist Bill Cairns with what the forecast is going to look like. But first, we want to go to Kathy Park, who is at Atlanta Hartsfield International Airport. Uh, Kathy, good to talk to you. The East Coast storm may be out of the region, but its impacts are still being felt. Uh, what do cleanup efforts look like right now? Yeah, Yasmin, good to be with you. The cleanup efforts, well, it's massive still in portions of the Northeast as well as New England. As you saw those dramatic images there, uh, there was a lot of rain that was dumped with yesterday's storm that led to flash flooding. At least five people died because of this storm. Some people just got caught in the floodwaters. Um, another individual died because of a falling tree. Um, you also mentioned tens of thousands of customers are still in the dark. Maine is one one of those states hit hard with power outages and also uh, in New Jersey we are told that a lot of the waterways in that state um, are swollen right now so they're at flood stage so a lot of things that we are still keeping an eye out on. How's the weather impacting travel um, Kathy as you're there at the airport a lot of folks wanting to get to where they're going just around the Christmas holiday what are you seeing? Yeah, so compared to yesterday when we saw thousands of cancellations and delays, things appear to be back on track. There were some delays and cancellations throughout the day. We are here in Atlanta, the busiest airport in the world, and I can tell you throughout the day today, it was pretty steady and smooth. But come Thursday and Friday in particular, airport officials are saying that's when we can see uh, the peak travel time uh, when passengers are going to be navigating through this airport, roughly 90,000 passengers. And you will, when you look at the whole holiday season in Atlanta um, through January 2nd, they're anticipating 3.3 million passengers. And then nationwide, we're looking at 7 million people taking to the skies. And earlier today, I had a chance to talk to some air travelers kind of navigating everything, the, the travel season. Um, here's what they told me. Take a listen. It's been good today. Well, other than this. <laughs> It's not bad so far. Yeah. I hate to jinx myself. I think I overslept, oh, but anyhow. No. Okay. But I'm I'm very excited to go on I miss it spend some time with the family.
And Yasmin, if you were one of the millions who are traveling the next couple of days, uh, TSA has uh, a couple of important dates to pass along. December 21st, Friday, December 29th, Monday, January 1st. Those are days you should be mindful of because they're supposed to be the busiest time this holiday yeah. season uh, with 2.5 million passengers each day. That's actually a 6% jump from this time last year. You gotta love the yes, mom ma who says, it's been good today, and the baby's like, not so much. <laughs> Kathy exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much, <laughs> appreciate it. Wanna bring in meteorologist Bill Cairns um, to talk more about the weather that we are seeing. Bill, you and I were talking about the East Coast yesterday, the cleanup happening. Yep. Um, obviously, Oof. you're in the East Coast now really packed a wall up there, right? Now we're looking at the West Coast. Yeah, and then you can see it. I mean, it's very clear. This bowling ball off the coast here is what's going to cause all the problems over the next couple of days. And now it's just a hit and miss. It's nothing that's concentrated, no big travel issues. And driving up towards Tahoe here, we have some snow, so that could be making it a little difficult. But it's as this bowling ball comes southwards in the next two days, that's when we'll have all the issues. And we now have flood watches that have been expanded all the way down to the U.S.-Mexico border, San Diego included, Oceanside, Los Angeles. Santa Barbara. We're mostly concerned about the mountainous areas and flash flooding too up to San Luis Obispo. So the timing of this. As we go throughout tonight, this band of heavy rain, this is what we will track, will be in Northern California. Then as we go through the day tomorrow, it's right around the Bay Area. It doesn't move too far inland in Central and Northern California, but I kind of pause this here at 5 p.m. Wednesday. This is when we start getting into the bulk of it. The heaviest rain will be in the mountains. We're worried about the burn scar areas. We get to mud and debris flows, and then this whole thing will come on shore Thursday. So we're already with a pretty high confidence level thinking that the worst chance of flooding the moderate risk Los Angeles, all the mountains, all the way back out through Santa Barbara. And that's going to be Wednesday night and Thursday. And so that's going to be a big concern if anyone's doing a driving or traveling through that region. And again, four inches plus rainfall is possible, which is significant. Okay, so you talked about it a little bit, but it's my favorite question, as you well know. And we're talking about holiday weather, right? What are the expectations on those major travel days? If you're driving, if you're flying, yeah. if you're taking the train, what should you do? Not a lot of snow. Definitely not. So here's our night. You know, like the, yeah. the holiday map, right? So this is as we go through the whole country. This is on Friday. East Coast, perfect. A little bit of light rain in the middle of the country. Notice there's nothing really cold. I mean, when you're 45 and Come 54, on. I mean, temperatures are very mild. Even Denver is going to be warm, too. By the time we get to Friday airports, maybe Chicago, Dallas, some minor issues. L.A., we already talked about that. Same we do in Phoenix on Friday. By the time we get to Saturday, we're still going to watch a little bit of rain. Some snow is going to break out in the mountains of Colorado and Utah, so they'll love that. Then on Sunday... There you go, Denver. Yeah. Denver, northwards. If Rapid City, possibly. Some areas of the Dakotas. If you're dreaming of a white Christmas, that's your forecast. I mean, we are temp we're 61 in Raleigh on Sunday and going all the way into Christmas Day, rain, Chicago, all the way down to the Gulf Coast. I know, not the best. East Coast is fine, but that rain will head your way the day after. So if you want a white Christmas, fly to Denver. Best chance, Denver heading up into areas of the Dakotas and maybe Just Nebraska. Think. Not many. This will be the lowest coverage for a white Christmas we've had in 20 years. Just think, Sunday night, kids, we're going to see Santa Claus flying over this country. Yeah, good thing Rudolph's <laughs> got that bright red nose and the windshield wipers. <laughs> to get through all that weather. Bill Cairns, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. All right, rescuers in northwestern China tonight up against freezing temperatures in a desperate race to rescue any survivors left behind after the deadliest earthquake the country has seen in years. This is what the scene looked like today. Homes destroyed, the streets filled with rubble. At least 127 people are dead in the region. You see here on this map in the aftermath of the 5.9 magnitude earthquake. You see the moment it happened here at a restaurant, uh, the camera starts shaking and people suddenly get up out of their chairs and they run for their lives. Janice McEfrere is in Beijing for us. It's an all-out race to try to find people in the rubble. Rescue teams have been working day and night in bitter cold temperatures. There are nearly 2,000 firefighters working at the epicenter, and temporary shelters have been set up. At least 127 people have been killed, according to officials. More than 500 are injured. The quake struck around midnight, the tremors lasting about 20 seconds, and they were still, hours later, feeling strong aftershocks. Videos show people rushing from their homes and then huddling in the bitter cold temperatures, uh, hovering around zero degrees Fahrenheit. Rescue officials say that the cold is hampering the efforts there and that the next 48 hours are crucial. 
This has happened in the part of the country that is mountainous, it's remote, earthquakes are not uncommon, but this is on course to be one of the deadliest in a decade. China's earthquake administration says the quake was shallow and powerful, uh, measuring magnitude 6.2. The initial USGS assessment puts it at magnitude 5.9. The government has issued uh, orders for a full-scale search and rescue effort. Money and equipment have been deployed to help people uh, get to safety, to help them find warmth. The concern, of course, is that the toll of this quake is going to rise. All right, as we speak, a volcano is erupting in Iceland. It's forcing thousands of people to evacuate their homes, but officials say that right now there's no threat to life. You're looking at live pictures of it right now, the volcano throwing molten rock some 300 feet into the air. Take a look at that. Incredible to see. Police declaring a state of emergency there, uh, stopping traffic from entering the area and closing down uh, nearby tourist sites. And officials now fear this is only the beginning of this eruption. Molly Hunter has more. The pictures are just unbelievable. Now, Icelandic officials are saying the eruption at this time is not life-threatening. The lava is actually moving away from population centers. They believe, though, it may last anywhere from a week to 10 days. And once that molten lava starts moving, it becomes impossible to stop. Stunning aerial images from southwestern Iceland, capturing a late night eruption, spewing searing hot lava from volcanic fissures. It comes after weeks of anticipation and earth shaking seismic activity. Icelandic officials say the eruptions brought on by a swarm of earthquakes Monday night, beginning northeast of Grindavik, a fishing village where a state of emergency was declared last month. The entire population of 4,000 people evacuated as a precaution. It's the fourth volcanic eruption in two years and the largest so far, with an initial fissure opening spanning three miles and lava shooting over some 300 feet into the air. It's just fascinating to see just nature in action. I just, it's just like something from a movie. The Icelandic Coast Guard surveying the area overnight in an effort to confirm the eruption's exact size and location. Passengers at one of Iceland's main airports, just 16 miles away, reacting. As soon as we know anything, we will let you know. Authorities have raised the country's aviation alert level because volcanic ash can pose a risk to engines on passenger planes, something that happened when another volcano erupted in Iceland back in 2010, creating an ash cloud that grounded air travel in Europe for more than a week. Monday's eruptions follows weeks of intense seismic activity that spurred thousands of earthquakes, prompting the closure of the country's iconic Blue Lagoon. Now officials are stressing vigilance and caution as the region waits on Mother Nature to run its course. Now, we know eruptions are unpredictable. Iceland is no stranger to major volcanic eruptions. Now, Icelandic officials say this morning that those huge lava fountains overnight, hundreds of feet, actually down to about 100 feet now. That is good news. And airport officials say at this time there are no disruptions, so flight schedules are running on time. Good news for travelers, of course, the week before Christmas. That also means no disruptions at this time throughout Europe. I'll send it back to you. All right, so right now in Israel, glimmers of hope emerging that there could be, and that is the key word here, could, uh, another break in the fighting with Hamas. Israel's president saying today his country is, quote unquote, ready for a second humanitarian pause in exchange for the release of more hostages. It's coming as top American leaders apply more pressure on Israel to protect the civilians caught in the middle, with the U.N. calling the levels of destruction in Gaza staggering and unprecedented, saying 60 percent of the infrastructure in Gaza it's completely destroyed, and 90% of Gazans are displaced from their homes. We're also seeing new concerns tonight. This fighting could spread wider in the region. With the situation inside the Red Sea unraveling, Yemen's Houthi militants saying they will not stop their attacks on ships passing through, even as the U.S. is rolling out a new coalition of nations to fight back. Holly Jackson is joining us live in Tel Aviv. How good to see you once again. Um, you've got this pressure from American officials, right? And now these comments from... Yeah the country's president. What are you hearing from people there on the ground? Right? Are they optimistic that something can actually get done, a deal can be made? Yeah, it's such a good question, Yaz, and it's good to see you. And I ask people that, these hostage family members, are you optimistic? Are you hopeful? And you know what I hear? They say, we have to be. 
We have to be because there's no other alternative. Like if we're not hopeful, then what is even worth getting out of bed in the morning? And so that is the sentiment that I think that you hear from so many of these people who have loved ones still being held in Gaza. The prime minister telling some of these families today, we can show you here, that I am personally committed to the release of the abductees. He said rescuing them is a supreme task. He was asked if he'll succeed. He says, I can give you one guarantee. We don't stop. And so those are some, some comments from him, obviously very strongly committing to trying to work to get to a deal to get these hostages home. Let me play for you uh, somebody else whose uh, son is being held in captivity. His name is Ruby Han. He's an American Israeli citizen. He was actually at the White House just recently talking with President Biden about this issue, trying to get the U.S. involved to put pressure uh, on Israel to do some kind of negotiation. Here's what Ruby said. It was a productive meeting where we also asked what we can do more for him. But at the end of the day, the buck stops here. He is the one that is responsible and the one that has the ability to bring our loved ones back home alive. So you're seeing dribs and drabs of discussions around how do you get these hostage negotiation talks restarted again. But I will say that there is some sort of level setting, some expectation setting from the Biden administration. But John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesman, spokesperson, saying it doesn't appear that any kind of breakthrough is imminent. But again, people here are drawing hope from what they can, like the fact that the CIA director, for example, met with his Qatari and Israeli counterparts in Europe. Yes. Um, we talked about this yesterday, the possible expansion um, of this war. We've seen dribbles of it to a certain extent. That's the right. situation in the Red Sea, right? The Houthi militia saying they're not going to get scared off by this new kind of American-led coalition uh, to protect crucial shipping lanes. What does this all mean for a possible expansion beyond the borders of Israel and Gaza? Well, listen, this is the the idea here is deterrence. And that's what you're hearing from top military officials, that if they can get U.S. ships into the Red Sea, then perhaps it would deter. They actually think that it would deter these attacks from Houthis. They say new numbers show that more than 100 such attacks have happened uh, in the Red Sea, in this critical area. You can see it on the map there that is so important for the global economy from a shipping perspective with these big multinational shipping companies pausing operations in that region. So if you think, okay, well, how does this work? What are the ships going to actually do? A senior military official puts it this way. If you're familiar with the I-95 corridor between D.C. and Boston, right. that's like the southern third of the Red Sea. There's something like 400 ships transiting through there on any given day, at any given time, I should say. So this is not man-to-man -man defense, if you will. They're not necessarily escorting each ship. It's kind of like zone defense. And that's the thinking here is sort mm -hmm. of umbrella protection, yes. That's a good way um, to put it, Holly Jackson for us. Thank you for joining us on your show. Um, NBC News, everybody, uh, learning a little before we went on the air that the FBI is investigating what officials describe as a significant number of email hoax bomb threats to Jewish institutions and synagogues across the United States. Uh, in recent days, that is according to an email that's sent to outside advisors and obtained by NBC News. The email says more than 30 of the country's 56 FBI field offices are investigating these threats, and they're believed to be connected. Ryan Riley is joining us now with more on this. Do investigators, Ryan, know anything about where these threats are coming from and why they think they are connected? Yeah, so the investigators actually think that these are originating from outside of the United States. And based on the similar language is why they're associating those with one another. And as you mentioned, you know, 30 of the 56 field offices of the FBI, that's a significant number and sort of gives you, gives you a sense of how large, widespread this is across the United States and just how involved the FBI is in this investigation um, at the moment. Now, these are, you know, hoax threats. These are not something that are being followed through on, but it's still something obviously very concerning for uh, these Jewish institutions, obviously. Uh, in this current climate that we're at with anti-Semitism on the, on the rise. It's something that uh, a lot of uh, synagogues have had an increased uh, police presence already, had hired more security guards. So it's certainly something that is putting a community that is already pretty stressed out even more on edge and why the FBI is really prioritizing this uh, to try to get to the bottom of where these are originating, Yasmin. All right, Ryan Riley for us. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Um, let's talk COVID for a moment. Hospitalizations, especially amongst the oldest and youngest Americans, they are up this holiday season. That's according to the CDC. Uh, this is happening as we're learning more about a new subvariant, putting that growing uh, fast and could put more people at risk. The CDC also says the prevalence of the subvariant that's already dominant in the Northeast more than doubled between late November and mid December. 
possibly getting an assist from holiday travel. And it's coming as we're seeing these high flu hospitalizations up 200 percent over the past four weeks as doctors continue to worry about the triple demic of COVID, RSV and the flu. I want to bring in Dr. John Torres to talk more about this. We literally talked about this last winter, the triple demic, exactly. right? COVID, flu, RSV. Here we are again. You can get vaccinated, by the way, to protect against RSV, against COVID, All three of them. and flu exactly. as well. Are we in it this winter? Are we in for it? You know, I think we're going to see rising case numbers here. And like you mentioned, those numbers are there on top of it. RSV, 60% increase in hospitalizations. COVID, 51% increase in hospitalizations. Silver lining, RSV seems to be tapering out a little bit. And okay. it might be coming down, but time will tell. And my fear is that over the holidays, people are going to get together. They're not going to take the appropriate measures they need to take. And we're going to see those numbers rise. And so I think we're going to see numbers go up. I don't think we're going to see repeat what we had the last couple of years. Are the cases of flu going up because less folks are getting vaccinated? Is there any correlation? So there? the vaccination rates are low, okay. and there is a direct correlation there because people not getting vaccinated, you can get yeah. the flu, you can get complications from the flu. But on top of that, flu and RSV, they're seasonal. So the seasonality of those are on us right now, meaning they are winter viruses. We know they're going to spread. They know they're going to increase. COVID is a year-long one, but it also can have seasonality, and that's what's happening as well. We're getting together for the holidays. We were together over Thanksgiving. Hanukkah, all these other holidays, we're going to see more and more people congregating, which means these viruses are going to have more of a chance to spread. You're seeing more and more people wearing masks. Um, should we be wearing masks at this point because of this possible triple demic that we are facing? Is it not as effective anymore? What should we do? You know, the one thing about masks, I think, is you know, always keep a mask on you. I have mine here. Mm -hmm. Friday, I was on an airplane. There was a gentleman sitting across from me, coughing, not covering up. Everybody's looking at him going, you know, just oh, nobody yeah, You don't want to cough on an airplane. And, and everybody's looking at him. I just took my mask out, put it on. A couple other people did as well. So keep it with you. And it's, it's going to be situational dependent. If you're in a situation, if you're in a subway, a bus, an airplane, an airport, something like that, and people around you seem sick, put the mask on. It's very simple. If you cough on an airplane, you might as well have the plague. <laughs> Everybody looks at you as if you do. He got do. a lot of stink eye. Yeah, I bet he did. Um, COVID in wastewater? Should we be worried about that? No, so what they're doing right now is with wastewater, they're actually using it to try and find out what is in that area. And it's a great way, way to go and survey large portions of populations without actually having to go door to door or swab people. You can look at the wastewater. We did that on airplanes during the pandemic. Now they're doing it in communities as well. And it just tells public health officials where they need to concentrate their resources and where they need to start saying, hey, there might be situations here. Let's start testing people. And if test numbers go up, then that's the point where you need to be a little bit concerned about it. Dr. John Torres, thank you. You bet. Appreciate it. All right, new reporting tonight on Target after it said a crime wave was to blame for a bunch of store closures. Now a new CNBC investigation found that stores that they kept open in the same areas as the stores they shut down had an even higher rate of theft and violence. Remember, stores across the country have seen a spike in smash and grabs this year. Videos like these going viral leading retailers to lock up more of their products. But now some experts are questioning some of the industry's claims about how bad this really is. A Target spokesperson saying in response to this, store level incidents vary widely in severity. A police data won't show the full extent of what our teams experience on the ground. CNBC retail reporter Gabrielle Fon Rouge, the author of the investigation, is joining us now with more on this. Um, Gabrielle, thanks for joining us on this. I, pre I appreciate it. If it wasn't course, actually yeah. the crime that Target blamed for closing down these nine stores, what else could it be? So there's a number of things that are going on here that are reporting uncovered. Um, if you take a look at some of the crime data that we've pulled, you, you can see this dynamic playing out in numerous jurisdictions. We had uh, store closures in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, and New York City. And if you look at those San Francisco numbers there, um, you can see that uh, at the Folsom Street store and at the Mission Street store, when I went to go visit these locations, they have vastly different foot traffic patterns and tourist um, activity, right? So at the Folsom Street store, that one is on the edge of town. It's near a highway. There had been a homeless encampment nearby, and that store was closed. It clocked 84 incidents. And then two miles away, you've got the Mission Street store. That is in the heart of San Francisco's shopping and tourist district. That one clocked about 486 incidents between 2021 and September of 2023. So while this location actually had a lot higher crime, Target chose to keep it open. And one of the factors that could be at play here is that there's simply more people going to those stores and more people spending money. Uh, based on the numbers, Gabrielle, that you found, it doesn't seem like closing these doors, as you talked about, it's a solution that really makes a dent in, in these crime reports and, and keeping also employees safe, which is a priority as well. 
Mm -hmm. What is Target, what are they saying about other steps they could be taking? Yeah, so Target right now, what they're trying to do is they're investing in security guards, they're investing in training their employees better. So actually at that Mission Street store that I was telling you about when I went to go visit it, you saw armed security guards outside. You don't really see that in New York City, but you do see that in different jurisdictions across the U.S., depending upon what kind of laws they might have. And, you know, back to that training. Retail employees right now, they need to learn how to use the register. They need to learn how to manage inventory, but they also need to learn how to de-escalate organized crime incidents. Gabrielle Fon Rouge, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, everybody, Utah facing a big legal threat tonight over its social media laws for minors, why a group of tech companies says the first in the nation laws are unconstitutional, plus a sad update around Celine Dion's health, what's reportedly happening now in the singer's battle with stiff person syndrome. All right, so police in California say a former NFL player is tied to a robbery spree. That's in our five things. Up first, though, the largest state in the country wants more of its residents to drink recycled wastewater. Today, California joined Colorado as the only states in the country to pass regulations that allow water agencies to pump highly purified recycled wastewater directly into the drinking supply. The state hopes this could provide a reliable source of drinking water for its 39 million residents as they struggle with low reservoirs because of drought. And this wouldn't be the first time California used recycled wastewater, but up until now, it's only been used for things like building ice rinks, making snow, and watering crops. Noah Pransky is joining us now with more on this. I tell you, I did a story about this um, in Singapore back in 2007 or so, where they were recycling water um, to drink. And at the time, I thought, no way. This can't work. This can't be happening. But it's happening now in this country. How does it work? Um, is it safe? And is it going to spread to other states as well? Yeah, I mean, I, the western states are really under the gun here because of the drought issues out west. Maybe not this year, but yeah. historically in climate change, obviously making it worse. So the western states, Colorado was first, California now second. They're going to give all of their local municipalities the option to put recycled, highly recycled, highly purified water back into the system directly where people can then drink it. It would help address the long-term issues across California. And again, this is highly purified, highly filtered water. Right. This is not something that you could tell so, uh, that was coming out of out of the sewer. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, all the standards are there. The technology is there. It's actually in many ways cleaner than many of the water supplies across America. So how do you get past the psychological kind of ick factor? That's of the all? number one issue, our number two, yeah. right? <laughs> um, it is a consumer confidence <laughs> issue here. Yeah. Uh, critics have labeled it toilet to tap, and that is a stigma that has really slowed the progress down here. Let's take a look help. at some of the other names that it's called. I mean, these don't exactly roll off the tongue, but you're talking about direct potable reused water, highly purified water, highly treated water, reclaimed water, ground replenishment. These are all technical names, but because they haven't stuck, we still call it toilet to tap in a lot of places. And in fact, it is so safe, our own Jacob Sobroff wanted to prove that drink he could it. drink it. Here's what it looked like when he took it to the test. That is delicious. I'm happy to report Jacob Sobrov, still part. healthy, still with us at NBC. No new growths in his head or anything like no, that. No. Uh, advocates remind us all water is recycled. So when is California going to get this recycled water? So it's going to be another six to nine months of approvals before it finally hits the ground. And then it could be six to seven more years of building these facilities. However, Orange County has been recycling water and pumping it into the ground since 2008. So you may see OC as well as LA and San Diego have started to put the ball in in motion here. You may see it a little sooner in some of the big municipalities. Noah Pransky, thank you. My pleasure. Appreciate it. All right, want to get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. We got number one, a new Senate report saying the U.S. terror watch lists are too broad and may violate travelers' rights. There's at least 22 different reasons a traveler could be stopped, something the report says could lead to unwarranted screening. They're calling on the Department of Homeland Security to review its practices. Number two, former NFL running back Derek Ward has been arrested on robbery charges, according to police. The 43-year-old helped the New York Giants beat the Patriots in the 2008 Super Bowl. Now he's being accused of robbing multiple businesses around Los Angeles. His manager could not be reached for comment. Number three, Celine Dion has lost control of her muscles as she battles 
stiff person syndrome, according to her sister. Remember, Dionne was forced to cancel her tour back in May because of the rare disorder which has affected her ability to walk and to sing. Her sister says she's going through treatment with the hope of returning to the stage. Number four, bagged spinach sold across seven states is being recalled over listeria concerns, according to the FDA. It was discovered during routine testing applies to Publix and Fresh Express brands. No illnesses have been reported so far. Number five, so you're wondering, why are you looking at a video of a cat named Taters chasing a laser around a couch? Because it's part of a NASA experiment that beamed this HD video to Earth from a satellite 19 million miles away he was using a super-powered laser. The idea is to test high-quality video streaming to help with future missions. All right, when we come back, some of the GOP's youngest voters speaking to our team tonight, what they want the future of the party to look like next. Plus, some Chick-fil-A restaurants could be forced to open on Sundays. We're going to explain coming up in the local. A lawsuit has been filed against the state of Utah by a group of major tech companies over its first in the nation laws that require children and teens to get parental consent to use social media apps. The trade group NetChoice, it's representing TikTok, Facebook parent company Meta, and X formerly known as Twitter. The laws set to take effect in March will prohibit minors from using social media between 10.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. unless authorized by a parent. And they will require age verification to open a social media account. The law is meant to protect children from targeted ads and addictive features on social media. But the lawsuit says the regulations are unconstitutional. Uh, Jake Ward is joining us now with more on this. Why, Jake, did the Utah government decide this is necessary? And, and why does NetChoice say it's unconstitutional? Well, Yasmin, you know, this, of course, is a reflection of the absolute lack of federal regulations when it comes to uh, how uh, technology, data privacy, everything else essentially works in the United States. You know, we have some very loose child protection and privacy laws, uh, but in terms of regulations around how old you have to be to open a social media account, uh, whether your, you know, data is protected as an adult or as a parent, all of that stuff is, you know, up in the air. And so this is uh, the state of Utah trying to sort of jump into that void. It joins states like Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, all of whom are trying to pass similar sorts of laws. But NetChoice here, that trade group re representing these big tech companies, big social media companies, essentially says this is unconstitutional, that it prohibits American citizens from, from having access to what they call public content. Uh, the the uh, trade group basically says it wants to, uh, you know, pull uh, away from government control is how they characterize this. Right. Um, you know, this law was set to go into effect March 1st, 2024, but uh, we're going to have to see how it plays out in court so, here. Yet. So these are the first kind, first of its kind in this country. Um, we talk a lot about, we've seen testimony of it on Capitol Hill as well, kids and social media, their mental health, how it affects them. Um, are there more in the pipeline? There's definitely more coming down the road. You know, we have uh, another uh, one in Arkansas that had been there, but NetChoice also sued in that state to try to put that one uh, aside. And Texas and Louisiana have similar laws, but they haven't gone into effect yet. You know, the timing here, Yasmin, uh, couldn't be more uh, pointed in terms of scientific consensus, which is slowly starting to build around the need to, to think about social media as something much more than just a recreational diversion for kids and something that really can affect its health, whether it's testimony from the American Psychological Association or a big research project that came out of the National Academy of Sciences just last week, uh, essentially saying that we need a lot more understanding before really understanding, you know, what the, the uh, potential harms and benefits of social media could be to kids. So a uh, big consensus there. And in the meantime, the lack of federal regulation seems to have led to this piecemeal state by state kind of action and the sorts of fights in court we're seeing as a result. Yasmin. Take word. Thank you. All right, so NBC covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it's tough to read, to watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment that we call the local. From our Northeast Bureau, at least one person is now dead after an explosion and heavy fire at a hotel in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Police are blaming the blast on propane. The hotel says it's now dealing with about a million dollars in damage. Authorities are investigating how it happened. Also from our Northeast Bureau, could Chick-fil-A open on Sundays? Well, maybe in some places, because New York state lawmakers are debating a bill 
that would require all restaurants and rest stops on state throughways to be open seven days a week, clashing with Chick-fil-A's policy of being closed on Sundays. The popular chicken chain has had that policy since it first started um, so that employees can, quote, rest and worship if they choose. And out of our Midwest Bureau, look at this. A Michigan man is spending a week living inside a giant red Salvation Army bucket to raise money for charity. Greg Bach says he's hoping to raise awareness for people experiencing homelessness. He plans to stay inside of the bucket until Christmas Eve or until he raises $200,000. Bach says they're about $130,000 shy of their goal. All right, I want to turn to 2024 now. Today marking the end of a four-day gathering of Republican voters unlike any other. I'm talking about the conservative nonprofit Turning Point USA's America Fest, which brought together thousands of high schoolers and college students from around the country to hear from Republican politicians and pundits, some uh, bringing their more extreme, far-right positions to the stage, including railing against feminism, and one speaker even defending, quote, life before suffrage, before women had the right to vote. One of our campaign embeds, Alex Tabbitt, was on the ground there talking to America's youngest conservative voters who shared some of those extreme views when asked about the leading female Republican candidate, Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, what did you make of her? Yeah, that's a total L candidate. Yeah. She's obviously a feminist and she's hiding it for the Republican voters. She's done nothing to impress me and yeah, she's a feminist and not a fan. What's yeah. wrong with feminism? So feminism, feminism is one of the biggest anti-women movements on the entire planet, and it's also one of the biggest lies. It's empowering women to be super independent and, you know, do these certain things, when in reality, we need to bring them back to the kitchen. Let's be honest, they're happiest at the home. We need to bring the families back together. The foundation of society is a family. And if you want to destroy the family, what do you do? Get the women out of the home. Okay, NBC's Vaughn Hilliard um, is following this for us and joining us now. <clears throat> My gosh. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a little <laughs> awestruck by what I just heard there. Um, that's sexist language. Yes. And saying something that was wrong with feminism, saying that women need to be back in the home, back in the kitchen, going out of the home is what destroys a family. Um, I can't even believe I'm hearing that in this day and age from, from a young person. Right. Are you surprised by that? No. Okay. Uh, I, I think the hardest part, if I may, more one of the harder parts of my job of being a political reporter and going out and talking to folks at events is trying to have a discussion about policy and substance. But that's not policy and substance. What no. you just said, that's sexist. Yeah. Uh, that's just, uh, it, it is, we are so far beyond that line of thinking, yet you heard that individual. He's 20 years old. There is a subsect of the American population where young people are growing up in homes where that is their view of how this country should be. And you, that event there, Turning Point USA, this organization that is putting this on, they are a massive organization that has raised more than hundreds of millions of dollars over the last several years. These are the young people that they are turning into political operatives, working on campaigns. They are the heart and soul of the future of the Republican Party. That makes me worried. Um, conspiracy theories as well, alive and well. I want to play some of that for folks, and then we'll talk. But it is clear that the election is stolen. If you look at it from a logical standpoint, it's hard to believe that that many people voted for Biden. The media stole the 2020 election. The minute that Donald Trump was sworn into office, the media, you know, CNN, um, many other outlets, and including NBC, I would argue, um, have said things where uh, they've slandered the approach and messaging, and they've argued that uh, Donald Trump is this most horrible, awful person, basically equivalent to Hitler. That's where the election started to be stolen. Yes, I think January 6th might have been an inside job. Yes. Yes, I do believe it was some sort of inside job, especially at the time being. It was perfect to set Trump up for disaster. I don't think it was an insurrection. There wasn't much violence. 
I, I definitely know you're not surprised by no. any of that. That spans every age um, of, the, of the Republican Party right now, reiterating really the lie of the former president of the United States, Rudy Giuliani, and others that continue to say the election was stolen in 2020. Right. Those conversations that are great and bad Alex Tappet was having there, those are reflective of such a great share of the Republican electorate today. You know, 18 years old, that young guy, when Donald Trump announced he was running for the White House, he was 10 years old. For this generation, wow. they have grown up with essentially Donald Trump is the elder, the statesman, mm -hmm. the, the face of this party, and That's election analysis, they trust him. Yeah. I mean, it, it, he's the age of their grandpas. Yeah. You, you trust uh, somebody who is the president of the United States. You trust the leader of your party, especially when your parents and your grandparents view him and hail him as uh, the embodiment of a great American patriot. So you said it. Many of these are new voters. They're young voters, right? 18, right. 19, 20 years old. Where are they leaning? Are they are they leaning towards the former president for a re-election? Absolutely. They had a, they had a straw poll at there, and 86 percent of the young people there voted for Donald Trump. There was 8 percent for Ron DeSantis, 8 for Vivek Ramaswamy. Ramaswamy spoke at this event and is very popular, oftentimes mentioned as the second choice because he's very much a Donald Trump, but a, a newer, younger Donald Trump. Uh, Nikki Haley, you heard one of those voices there. Uh, there's a view that she is a, a globalist, is a word that is so often used not America first. Uh, there is very a, a, a very uh, insulated view of what America's role should be in on the world stage and that they need to be uh, closing the borders. They need to be taking care of people at home. Mm -hmm. And that is where you hear some of these voices. It extends, though, into more radical far right uh, uh, things. And that is where I think the Republican Party is going to have to reckon with a young generation that are growing up with very old views, but their views views that I think are reflective of, of a part of the electorate that I don't think that we fully appreciate just how large it is. Yeah, and I, have to, I do have to say, though, it's not completely reflective of the entire no. Republican Party. And important to say that because there are other young people in the Republican Party that are actually thinking quite differently. Right. Than and this. have conservative views. I yeah. mean, there is there is still very much I run into these people that say, you know, they wish that some voices like Nikki Haley would be able to rise to the top of the party right. uh, because in so many ways, these are not reflective of the great of a great share of the the the, the younger generation and the Republican Party at large, but right now there's such a dominating force in the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ted Cruz, Vivek Ramaswamy, yeah. Don Jr., uh, Tucker Carlson. Prominent voices are at events like this that are speaking to these people. Yeah. Ron Hilliard, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, coming up, a stunning New York Times investigation finding that thousands of young kids are doing one of the most dangerous jobs in America. I'll go one-on-one -on -one with the reporter behind the story. That's next. All right, it's time to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. Across the country, thousands of young children are doing one of the most dangerous jobs in this country, roofing. That's according to the New York Times investigation. Children, some as young as elementary school, tell the Times they're waking up before dawn, carrying heavy bundles of shingles that leave their arms shaking and working through heat waves on black tar roofs that burn their hands and one slip could be deadly. It is important to note these are jobs children should not be doing in the first place. It's against federal law for anyone under the age of 18 to work in roofing because it is so dangerous. But for migrant children coming into this country, often without their parents, it is a job that is in high demand and it pays well. That's what teachers, social workers, labor organizers, and federal investigators are telling the Times. The Times spoke to more than 100 kids working these jobs, kids like Juan Sario in New Orleans, who says he's been replacing roofs and working 12-hour shifts almost every day since he came to the U.S. from Guatemala four years ago. He told them he'd like to go to school or at least join a soccer team, but he can't because he has to work and he has to pay the rent. Hannah Dreyer is one of the reporters who worked in the story. She's an investigative reporter for The New York Times, and she is joining us now. This is incredible to even think about. So I'm thankful that you brought this investigative piece to us. Um, you spoke to a lot of different roofing teams, a lot of different kids that are working these jobs, a lot of people in this situation. One of the people that you spoke with from a roofing team essentially told you they cannot turn people away. They don't want to turn these underage kids away because they feel like they're in need. I mean, it's a really shocking thing. Here in this country, there are child roofers, a category that is not supposed to exist. Yeah. All over the country, we found more than 100 kids in almost two dozen states, and they're here on their own. 
So they're not working an after school job or working because they want to. They're working because they're really on the hook to make money, just like an adult. Some of them are working 12 hour days and getting paid, you know, $70 for one of the most dangerous jobs in this country. You talked to Anthony Padilla, who's been doing this. Um, he fell almost 30 feet from a roof onto cement blacktop, onto cement ground. He can finds it hard to even do some basic tasks today, and he's no longer able to work. How did you find out about him? How did you find out about his story? What did he tell you? You know, child labor laws are really here so that children are protected from things like this. They're not so the kids stay in school as much as about protecting children's safety. And so roofing is one of these occupations where children are falling sometimes to their deaths because it's just so dangerous. Anthony is one of many children who didn't die when he fell, but he was severely injured. Does he have brain injuries? He's brain damaged. Half of his body really doesn't work. Oh gosh. This is a kid who was 14 when he came here. He was 15 when he fell. And now he spends most of his days in a trailer, sitting on his bed, looking at TikTok videos of other roofers, not really able to speak or communicate. And he's undocumented, so he can't really have any repercussions. He can't go after anybody or sue anybody for his injuries. I mean, he tried to get a workers' comp case. There were three contractors. They were all responsible. And they basically spent a year fighting about who should be on the hook for this 15-year-old's injury. He's gotten almost no medical care. You have spoken to a lot of people that are in this situation, not just roofing, other dangerous jobs as well for migrant children. Has any of these practices changed? Has it moved the needle at all for protecting kids like this? I mean, we are seeing a wave of migrant child labor in this country. Nearly 400,000 children have come across the border just since 2021 without their parents. They're here alone, and a lot of them are working jobs in factories. They're in slaughterhouses overnight. They're making household brands. And the Department of Labor has said that they're going to start cracking down on this abusive practice. But what we're seeing is more and more kids are coming and more and more kids are working. So troubling. Hannah Dreyer, really important stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Still to come, what happens when a major studio splits with one of its main actors? We're talking about Marvel's next move. Coming up next. We are coming on the air tonight with the impact of severe weather on two fronts. The West Coast tonight bracing for a powerful storm to hit. And then on the East, a new look at the rescue efforts happening in New Jersey to save people from the dangerous floodwaters there. Uh, what we're hearing from first responders tonight, plus a significant number of hoax bomb threats towards Jewish institutions and synagogues happening across the United States, according to the FBI. What we know tonight about those threats and how they could all be connected and how recycled toilet water could end up coming out of your kitchen sink. It's part of a push in California to get reliable drinking water to people in a region dealing with extreme droughts. We'll explain. Then Utah getting hit with a new lawsuit today. Why big companies like TikTok, Meta and others say the state cannot just ban kids from using their apps, even if they don't have parental consent. Plus, young conservatives weigh in on the Republican slate of candidates. Some of the extreme views they shared when asked about the only woman running in the 2024 race. Hey, everybody, I'm Yasmin in for Hallie Jackson, who's on assignment in Israel. Tonight, as the West Coast is prepping for a storm to hit, the East Coast is cleaning up after a wet and windy, deadly and disastrous storm. Communities just totally underwater. And the concern is not over. Several rivers are in major flood stage. One town telling people to evacuate immediately. And tonight we know this storm took the lives of at least five people just yesterday from either fallen trees or swept away in floodwaters. Those factors are still in play today as flood makes it uh, difficult for both rescue crews and people to get where they need to go. In New Jersey, firefighters were not able to stop a fire at this home because of the flooding. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. And still hundreds of thousands of people across the region are in the dark tonight after fallen trees took out power lines. Maine's governor declaring a state of emergency for several counties. Now Mother Nature has her eyes set on the West Coast with storms about to bring rain and snow to the Golden State. It's put more than 20 million people under flood watches as the holiday approaches.
The busiest days for travel just days away. More than two and a half million people expected to go through the airport on Thursday. We have meteorologist Bill Cairns with that forecast in just a moment. But first, want to go to Emily Ikeda in Patterson, New Jersey for us with more on this. Um, Emily, this East Coast storm, it's gone, but the impacts are getting worse for some. You witnessed a rescue today. Talk us through it. Yeah, that's right, Yasmin. Good to be with you. As you can see, the floodwaters are still lingering in the area. Keep in mind, more than a day since this part of New Jersey even saw any rain. For reference, we've got the Passaic River not far from where I'm standing. What happens with these larger rivers, these swollen rivers across the region, they could spill over into communities even days after a storm has passed because the grounds are so saturated. As these smaller tributaries, these other waterways lead into the major rivers, there's nowhere else for those uh, for that water to go except into the community. We've seen the water level rising throughout the day. Uh, the Passaic River, for instance, could remain at flood stage, at least parts of it, at least through Friday. So these are days long impacts even after the storm has exited the area. Not far from where I'm standing, we witnessed a water rescue earlier today. A 14 year old, she had been inside her home. The water levels came up unexpectedly and her sister, her concerned sister, called 911 and asked them to go retrieve her. So we went along long on board the truck uh, where they were able to get her safely onto dry ground. Here's more from some first responders. Take a listen. We want to move them out. Keep the time in the water to a minimum is the, is the object here is to take them in, get them situated, make sure they have what they need, get them out and get them through the flood waters as quick as possible. And Yasmin, we know at least five people have died in the Northeast from Monday's monstrous storms. Some of those from falling trees, others from rushing floodwaters. Yasmin. And Emily, what about power outages? I know a lot of people uh, still don't have power. It's getting colder out there. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen these temperatures plummet. We can feel the cold setting in right now. And also the floodwaters are very cold as well. There are more than 400,000 people in the Northeast without power still tonight. A lot of those coming from the main area. You'll see more than 300,000 people without power there. Also a significant number in Massachusetts as well. Crews throughout the entire region saying that they are working feverishly to restore power. You think about some of the wind gusts we saw topping more than 60 miles an hour in at least seven states that knocked down so many trees, so many power poles. Just a short time ago, the governor of Maine declaring a state of civil emergency to free up as many state resources as possible to help respond to the aftermath of this brutal storm, including these lingering power outages, Yasmin. All right, Emily Akita for us. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate it. I want to bring in meteorologist Bill Karen to talk more about this. So we were talking about um, the East Coast, obviously now dealing with the cleanup efforts there. Um, what are we expecting in the West, Bill? Uh, flash flooding and uh, some debris flows. I mean, it won't be as widespread as what we're dealing with in the Northeast, but for the areas that, you know, near Los Angeles especially, you, know, you get millions of people that are potentially uh, in harm's way. So the storm system that is going to cause all the problems is this little swirl sitting here off the coast. We call it a cutoff low. It's not really flowing across the country. It's going to move very slowly, and they're also very unpredictable. They're, you know, the forecast confidence is not as high with this storm as you'd say a regular storm that would come into the California coastal areas. We have 20 one million people from San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Oceanside, to San Diego, all under flood watches. This goes all the way out through Friday morning. So this is going to be a long duration event, too. So here we are, 5 p.m. Wednesday. We have heavy rain tomorrow, just beginning to head towards the San Luis Obispo area. Notice L.A., you're still pretty dry. Even as we go into Wednesday night and Thursday, just hit and miss showers, the brunt of the storm still off the coast. So if we keep a lot of it offshore, the flood threat will be less. Eventually, though, this does have to rotate through maybe even some thunderstorms and the heavy rain over some burn scar areas is the biggest concern. Then we get the mud and debris flows and you know what happens if that's the case and anyone traveling the airports, too. So as we go through Thursday, this area of Maroon, greatest risk right around Santa Barbara of the uh, flash flooding and maybe even significant flash flooding. We head that more towards Los Angeles as we go throughout Friday morning. So that's shifted a little bit, delayed a little bit for the L.A. area and rainfall totals. Yeah. Been, I mean, we could be talking anywhere, you know, two to four inches, especially in the mountains just outside of L.A. And they're actually in a rainfall deficit. The, the rains, rainy season began in November. We haven't talked much about them. They haven't, really haven't had a big storm yet. This will be the first one. So that would be actually good news for them. It's good for the reservoirs, but not if you have to travel in it. So I I'm getting a call in from the North Pole. <laughs> That's what the, that, <laughs> they're telling everyone. If you want to see snow, it, you have well, to go yes. to the North Pole. Yeah. Santa <laughs> wants to know the weather for Christmas. 
Yeah. We, well, what I, are the expectations when we, when we think about holiday yes, the, uh, weather? Limited ice and snow problems. Okay. Yes, maybe some sunscreen, <laughs> Yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah, so let's go through this. This is Friday. Friday, we're going to see some rain showers in the middle of the country. That storm that was in California by Saturday begins to work its way through the country. We will get some snow out of this. If you're in the Wasatch Range, the mountains there in Utah, you get snow. And also, my friends in the San Juan Mountains, you're on Telluride, we'll get some good snow. It looks like if you're in Denver, you may have to wait until Saturday night or Sunday to kind of get some of this heading your way. You so go. if you want the winter wonderland, and this is going to be on Christmas Eve, maybe our friends Wyoming, Cheyenne, the there Denver, uh, Rapid City, up through the, you know, the Dakotas, that's the best shot. But if you're from Minneapolis, Great Lakes, East Coast. These guys are going to be skiing on Christmas Day. Oh, they're going to be throwing it in the air and having a powder party. Bill Karens and I both love to ski. Thanks, yes. Bill. Appreciate it. All right, turning to international news, um, where rescuers in northwestern China tonight up against freezing temperatures in a desperate race to rescue any survivors left behind after the deadliest earthquake the country has seen in years. This is what the scene looked like today. Homes are destroyed. The streets are filled with rubble. At least 127 people are dead in the region. You see here on this map in the aftermath of the 5.9 magnitude earthquake um, you see the moment that it happened here at a restaurant the camera starts shaking and people suddenly get up to run out of their chairs and for their lives janice mackey frere is in beijing it's an all-out race to try to find people in the rubble rescue teams have been working day and night in bitter cold temperatures there are nearly 2,000 firefighters working at the epicenter and temporary shelters have been set up at least 127 people have been killed according to officials more than 500 are injured the quake struck around midnight the tremors lasting about 20 seconds and they were still hours later feeling strong aftershocks videos show people rushing from their homes and then huddling in the bitter cold temperatures temperatures uh, hovering around zero degrees Fahrenheit. Rescue officials say that the cold is hampering the efforts there and that the next 48 hours are crucial. This has happened in the part of the country that is mountainous, it's remote. Earthquakes are not uncommon, but this is on course to be one of the deadliest in a decade. China's earthquake administration says the quake was shallow and powerful, uh, measuring magnitude 6.2. The initial USGS assessment puts it at magnitude 5.2. The government has issued uh, orders for a full-scale search and rescue effort. Money and equipment have been deployed to help people uh, get to safety, to help them find warmth. The concern, of course, is that the toll of this quake is going to rise. All right, as we speak, a volcano erupting in Iceland, forcing thousands of people to evacuate their homes, but officials saying that right now there's no threat to life. You're looking at live pictures of it right now, the volcano throwing molten rock some 300 feet into the air, police declaring a state of emergency, stopping traffic from entering the area, and closing down nearby tourist sites. Officials now fearing this is only the beginning of this eruption. Molly Hunter has more. The pictures are just unbelievable. Now, Icelandic officials are saying the eruption at this time is not life-threatening. The lava is actually moving away from population centers. They believe, though, it may last anywhere from a week to 10 days. And once that molten lava starts moving, it becomes impossible to stop. Stunning aerial images from southwestern Iceland, capturing a late-night eruption, spewing searing hot lava from volcanic fissures. It comes after weeks of anticipation and earth-shaking seismic activity. Icelandic officials say the eruptions brought on by a swarm of earthquakes Monday night, beginning northeast of Grindavik, a fishing village where a state of emergency was declared last month. The entire population of 4,000 people evacuated as a precaution. It's the fourth volcanic eruption in two years and the largest so far, with an initial fissure opening spanning three miles and lava shooting over some 300 feet into the air. It's just fascinating to see just nature in action. I just, it's just like something from a movie. The Icelandic Coast Guard surveying the area overnight in an effort to confirm the eruption's exact size and location. Passengers at one of Iceland's main airports, just 16 miles away, reacting. As soon as we know anything, we will let you know. 
Authorities have raised the country's aviation alert level because volcanic ash can pose a risk to engines on passenger planes, something that happened when another volcano erupted in Iceland back in 2010, creating an ash cloud that grounded air travel in Europe for more than a week. Monday's eruptions follows weeks of intense seismic activity that spurred thousands of earthquakes, prompting the closure of the country's iconic Blue Lagoon. Now officials are stressing vigilance and caution as the region waits on Mother Nature to run its course. Now we know eruptions are unpredictable. Iceland is no stranger to major volcanic eruptions. Now Icelandic officials say this morning that those huge lava fountains overnight hundreds of feet actually down to about 100 feet now. That is good news. And airport officials say at this time there are no disruptions, so flight schedules are running on time. Good news for travelers, of course, the week before Christmas. That also means no disruptions at this time throughout Europe. I'll send it back to you. All right, Molly Hunter, thank you for that. Right now in Israel, glimmers of hope emerging that there could be, could be key word here, another break in the fighting with Hamas. Israel's president saying today his country is, quote unquote, ready for a second humanitarian pause in exchange for the release of more hostages. It is coming as top American leaders apply some more pressure on Israel to protect the civilians caught in the middle, accounting for civilians, with the UN calling the levels of destruction in Gaza staggering and unprecedented, saying 60% of the infrastructure inside Gaza, it's completely destroyed, and that 90% of Gazans are displaced from their homes. Ali, Hallie Jackson is back with us um, from Tel Aviv. Pressure from all sides, Hal, right? From the American government, from families totally. of these hostages, from protesters in the streets of Tel Aviv every single day. Is that going to be enough at this point to force these negotiations back to the table? I know they were in Warsaw talking about this, but can they get something done? Yeah. So it does seem like they're going to, at some point, have to, based on the pressure that you're talking about. The question is, does that turn into a reality? And if so, on what kind of timeline here? And what would those terms even look like? I have to keep emphasizing this because it is important expectation setting that the U.S., the National Security Council spokesperson, says that it does not appear that a deal is imminent. But that does not mean that there is no possibility of a deal. That second part was my phrasing, Yaz. That's not what he said. I'm saying there has been at least some action. For the first time over these past 24, 48 hours in, like, weeks, we've been able to say that there are actually concrete steps towards some kind of talks. Part of this is spurred by what happened happened here last week, the revelation that three Israeli hostages were killed by their own military in this horrific case of friendly fire. They had either escaped, that's what some family members say, they were perhaps abandoned, but either way, they got away from their captors, they tried to hold up a white flag, call for help, they were shot by the IDF, which did not realize, they say, that they were civilians there, the IDF saying that broke the rules of engagement. That has really sparked a new pressure point here, a new kind of inflection point that we've been seeing right. build really over the past four or five days or so, coming to a head with this meeting, um, and I want to say, uh, play a little bit or show a little bit of what the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, had to say after meeting with some of these hostage family members. And by the way, this is a meeting that they've wanted for a while, for days now. He said, I am personally committed to the release of all the abductees. Rescuing them is a supreme task. He says, will I succeed? I can give you one guarantee. We don't stop. Hostage families have been wanting to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. They've been wanting to make the case that time is running out, that with each bombardment that Israel issues into Gaza, each of these strikes, that potentially puts not just civilians at risk, but hostages too, Yasmin. You mentioned this, Hal, um, and that was the killing of the three hostages in Gaza by, by the IDF. The That's Israeli right. government wants to make sure this doesn't happen again. They have to make sure this doesn't happen again for their own sake. You're speaking to people right. who have been on the ground there about this kind of unique chaos of, of the battlefield inside Gaza. Yeah, it's it, I mean, what the war is like from somebody who's been in it. We spoke with uh, an Israeli-American soldier. He's actually originally from Great Neck, New York. He was shot by a sniper, he says, uh, in an in a attack, essentially, that killed his commander. We visited him in one of the hospitals here, just outside Tel Aviv. Here's what he told us. Chaos is Hamas' number one goal. I think it's their number one goal, not just on the battlefield, but in the terrorist attacks that they conducted before this all started, of course. And then in the basically social media war that has now progressed forward, um, which is to make a lot of noise, uh, make it tough to define and discern evil from good. 
is also found on the battlefield in the way they fight. So some perspective there from somebody who's fought on behalf of the Israelis. The, the, the other piece of this, too, when we talk about pressure, and Yasmin, you mentioned this, not just on Benjamin Netanyahu, but also on uh, from the international community, right? right? Like the idea that you're seeing these other countries start to say, listen, what we're seeing in Gaza is just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, the Red Crossing, it is a moral failure, essentially. And, and that is something that we are also starting to see build because of images like the ones that you're showing here, the horrific humanitarian crisis there with nearly 20,000 Palestinians believed to have been killed in Gaza, according to the Hamas-run health ministry, Yasmin. Day to day, this war is changing. Day to day, this war is becoming more devastating. Hallie Jackson. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it. Um, NBC News learning a little before we went on the air that the FBI is investigating what officials describe as a, quote, significant number of email hoax bomb threats to Jewish institutions and synagogues across the United States. In recent days, that's according to an email sent to outside advisors and obtained by NBC News. The email says more than 30 of the country's 56 FBI field officers are investigating these threats, and they're believed to be connected. Ryan Riley is joining us now. Do investigators, Ryan, know anything about where these threats are coming from and why they think they are connected? Yeah, so the investigators actually think that these are originating from outside of the United States. And based on the similar language is why they're associating those with one another. And as you mentioned, you know, 30 of the 56 field offices of the FBI, that's a significant number and sort of gives you, gives you a sense of how large, widespread this is across the United States and just how involved the FBI is in this investigation um, at the moment. Now, these are, you know, hoax threats. These are not something that are being followed through on, but it's still something obviously very concerning for uh, these Jewish institutions, obviously. Uh, in this current climate that we're at with anti-Semitism on the, on the rise. It's something that uh, a lot of uh, synagogues have had an increased uh, police presence already, had hired more security guards. So it's certainly something that is putting a community that is already pretty stressed out even more on edge and why the FBI is really prioritizing this uh, to try to get to the bottom of where these are originating, Yasmin. All right, Ryan Riley for us. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. So COVID hospitalizations, especially amongst the oldest and youngest Americans, are up this holiday season, according to the CDC. It's happening as we're learning more about a new subvariant, putting that uh, growing fast and could put more people at risk. Uh, the CDC also says the prevalence of the subvariant that's already dominant in the Northeast, more than doubled between late November and mid-December, possibly getting an assist from holiday travel. And this comes as we're seeing high flu hospitalizations, up 200% over the past four weeks as doctors continue to worry about the triple-demic of COVID, RSV, and the flu. Dr. John Torres, joining me now. We literally talked about this last winter, the triple-demic, exactly. right? Exactly. COVID, flu, RSV, here we are again. You can get vaccinated, by the way, to protect against RSV, against COVID, All three of them. and a flu exactly. as well. Are we in it this winter? Are we in for it? Yeah, I think we're going to see rising case numbers here. And like you mentioned, those numbers are there on top of it. RSV, 60% increase in hospitalizations. COVID, 51% increase in hospitalizations. Silver lining, RSV seems to be tapering out a little bit, and it might be coming down but time will tell and my fear is that over the holidays people are going to get together they're not going to take the appropriate measures they need to take and we're going to see those numbers rise and so i think we're going to see numbers go up i don't think we're going to see repeat what we had the last couple of years are the cases of flu going up because less folks are getting vaccinated is there any correlation so there? the vaccination rates are low okay. and there is a direct correlation there because people not getting vaccinated you can get yeah. the flu you can get complications from the flu but on top of that flu and rsv they're seasonal so the seasonality of those are on us right now meaning they are winter viruses. We know they're going to spread. They know they're going to increase. COVID is a year-long one, but it also can have seasonality, and that's what's happening as well. We're getting together for the holidays. We were together over Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, all these other holidays. We're going to see more and more people congregating, which means these viruses are going to have more of a chance to spread. You're seeing more and more people wearing masks. Um, should we be wearing masks at this point because of this possible triple-demic that we are facing? Is it not as effective anymore? What should we do? You know, the one thing about masks that I think is, you know, always keep a mask on you. I have mine here. Mm -hmm. 
Friday, I was on an airplane. There was a gentleman sitting across from me, coughing, not covering up. Everybody's looking at him, going, you know, just oh, nobody yeah, You don't want to cough on an airplane. And, and everybody's looking at him. I just took my mask out, put it on. A couple other people did as well. So keep it with you. And it's, it's going to be situational dependent. If you're in a situation, if you're in a subway, a bus, an airplane, an airport, something like that, and people around you seem sick, put the mask on. It's very simple. If you cough on an airplane, you might as well have the plague. <laughs> Everybody looks at you as if you do. He got do. a lot of stink eye. Yeah, I bet he did. Um, COVID in wastewater? Should we be worried about that? No, so what they're doing right now is with wastewater, they're actually using it to try and find out what is in that area. And it's a great way, way to go and survey large portions of populations without actually having to go door to door or swab people. You can look at the wastewater. We did that on airplanes during the pandemic. Now they're doing it in communities as well. And it just tells public health officials where they need to concentrate their resources and where they need to start saying, hey, there might be situations here. Let's start testing people. And if test numbers go up, then that's the point where you need to be a little bit concerned about it. Dr. John Torres, thank you. You bet. Appreciate it. All right, some breaking news, everybody. Just into us in the last couple of minutes, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court banning former President Trump from the state's ballot, saying he is ineligible to hold the office of the presidency under the Constitution's insurrection clause. The case is now likely to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, NBC Sahil Kapoor is following this for us. Um, Sahil, if you will, walk us through this ruling first. Yeah, it's an absolutely extraordinary ruling, Yasmin, by the Colorado Supreme Court. It says, quote, a majority of the court holds that President Trump is disqualified from holding the office of president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Specifically, Section 3 says uh, no officers uh, of the country can have engaged in insurrection. The court essentially found that Trump engaged in insurrection and reversed a lower court ruling that presidents are not subject to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, saying they are subject to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I cannot think of any precedent to this for any major presidential candidate in modern times, certainly not one who is marching to the, the uh, nomination of his party, uh, you know, dominating the field at this moment. This might uh, have, have some sort of an impact on that Republican primary field with the Iowa caucuses uh, just about a month or so away. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that, if you will. So he'll draw on that moment for me, if you will, because as we're looking at the primary beginning in just about a few weeks or so. Um, what are we looking at here if the former president cannot be on the ballot in, in Colorado? We'll firstly wait to see how his rivals respond. It's unclear whether they will see this as essentially target practice to argue that Donald Trump should not be the nominee of his party if he's subject huh. to these kinds of serious challenges. You know, it's it's not that difficult to imagine a rival saying, "Don't nominate someone who is found to have been in, to, found uh, to have engaged in insurrection by a state supreme court." Now, Colorado is not exactly a competitive state at this point. It's widely expected to be in the Democratic column. Right. Uh, whoever the two candidates are, but there are other challenges happening in other states. They have not yes. been successful so far, at least, but uh, in Arizona, in Michigan, and in Minnesota, which are more competitive states, um, the challenges uh, have been issued. Could potentially Donald Trump be disqualified from the ballot in a swing state? That would be a massive disadvantage to Republicans. Now, on the other hand, Donald Trump himself has argued that this is a nonsense and election interference lawsuit. Uh, in some cases where, he, where Donald Trump has been found to be in legal jeopardy, his rivals have simply rushed to his defense, and it's only helped him in the Republican primary. So there are a lot about the politics of this that have yet to shake out. Yeah, the message and the precedent here is what I'm really focusing in on here. Um, Sahil, if you will, stand by for me. We want to bring in um, Danny Savalas to talk more about this. This is incredible, um, this decision here. Danny, if you will, walk us through kind of your reaction um, first in hearing this. I will walk you through up to page two, because that's where I've gotten so far, as this is just <laughs> breaking. But no, I have the general gist. And the gist is this, is that under Colorado's election code, uh, because Donald Trump was concluded after a five-day trial to have engaged uh, by clear and convincing evidence in an insurrection, he is therefore uh, barred by the Constitution from being on the ballot uh, under Colorado law. So the important question is going to be, how presidential is this? Well, outside of Colorado, not very. Uh, this okay. is a Colorado state court decision. And in addition, it's interpreting not just the federal constitution, but also how that affects Colorado's own election laws. So uh, while it is certainly what we call persuasive authority for other jurisdictions, other states, outside of Colorado, it's mostly, it is going to be cabined to this jurisdiction. But make no mistake about it, it is a, uh, a signal to many other courts, a blueprint, if you will, uh, for 
for them to take a look at their own election codes, see how similar they are, and see if this acts as a similar bar. Well, you talk about other courts as well, and I just want to reiterate to folks and remind folks where this is actually coming from, and I'm going to reach for my phone here because I want to make sure I'm getting it right. Danny, a group of Colorado voters backed by Citizens for Responsibility, some of which Sahil got into, um, and ethics in Washington, initially filed this legal challenge to Trump's candidacy in September, arguing that his efforts to overturn the 2020 election results on his conduct surrounding the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, making him ineligible for office. So whether or not things are actually in motion, Danny, and obviously, as you say, a blueprint to other courts as well, uh, when it comes to whether or not the former president can be on the ballot, what about other groups filing more um, instances like this to move something like this forward in the run-up to the election? Is that something that is a possibility? That's exact, exactly right. I mean, it still doesn't solve conclusively the problem of how do we determine whether or not the president, the former president, engaged in an insurrection. In this case, the court, the district court below, conducted a trial to have an evidentiary hearing and arrive at a conclusion on that issue. But I don't know that this decision uh, conclusively decides how other states make that determination. And really what you're going to have is as uh, other plaintiffs may file suit, you're going to arrive possibly at very different decisions, which is ordinarily uh, a good indicator that it's something that may arrive up at the Supreme Court. Uh, not necessarily because you have differing interpretations of different states of election laws, but the reason why is that the way those affect uh, the federal constitution and the federal election process, which is provided for in the Constitution. While the Supreme Court might normally let individual states handle their own state law, that's the kind of thing they stay away from. Uh, with the constitutional implications and the federal election law implications, uh, this is something that we may see end up at the Supreme Court. Talk us through this legalese speak, um, Danny. It's not that legalese, but legalese. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor memorialized today in a funeral service held at the National Cathedral. President Biden and Chief Justice John Roberts spoke about her legacy, O'Connor made history in 1981, becoming the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, number two, the ACLU and other civil rights organizations are now suing Texas over that controversial new immigration law that would let police arrest migrants who cross the border illegally and let local judges order them to leave the country. The suit claims the law is unconstitutional because the federal government has sole authority over immigration. If the law does not get blocked by the courts, it'll go into effect in March. Number three, officials in Florida think some kind of gas issue caused a home to explode last night. Four people, including two children, were inside the house at the time and taken to a hospital. We don't know how badly they were hurt. Officials saying they're still looking into an exact cause. Uh, number four, Southwest Airlines has reached a new labor agreement with its pilots union. It puts to rest months of negotiations, making it the last major U.S. airline to reach a deal to give pilots a big raise. The five-year deal is worth about $12 billion, according to the president of the company's Pilots Association. And number five, Jeff Bezos' space company, Blue Origin, successfully launching its first mission in over a year. The uncrewed rocket is carrying dozens of research payloads, some from NASA, and others are experiments designed by schools and students. All right, the largest state in the country wants more of its residents to drink recycled wastewater. Today, California joined Colorado as the only state in the country to pass regulations that allow water agencies to pump highly purified recycled wastewater directly into the drinking supply. The state hopes this could provide a reliable source of drinking water for its 39 million residents as they struggle with low reservoirs because of drought. And this wouldn't be the first time California used recycled wastewater, but up until now, it's only been used for things like building ice rinks, making snow, and watering crops. Noah Pransky has found this for us and joining us now. I'll tell you, Noah, and you and I spoke about this. I was in Singapore about, I don't know, 14 years ago when they were recycling water. And I said, ew, how does this work? And now it's here. And I guess makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really well filtered water. It's so filtered, it's actually cleaner by most regards than a lot of the other drinking water in America. But this isn't a new technology. Uh, as you mentioned, Singapore and other places have been doing it. In America, yeah. we've seen different cities and country, uh, counties 
use this technology to put the water often back into the ground, into the reservoirs or aquifers, but never directly into the drinking system. That's what California is looking to do right now. But it is the same system that the International Space Station uses. So if it's good enough wow. for astronauts, you're going to proponents say... it's good enough for all of us, for civilians. Um, how do you get past that ill factor? <laughs> the number one problem here, right, it is a marketing issue here. Uh, this technology isn't new. The water is super clean. So why won't people drink it? Well, they're concerned about poo water. It's been labeled toilet to tap. <laughs> and it's not really a helpful moniker. In fact, the other technical scientific names are direct potable reused water, highly purified water, highly treated water, reclaimed water, ground replenishment. All of these things probably better for selling this technology to yeah. consumers, but doesn't roll off the tongue. This is what Jacob Soberoff did when he took a taste. That is delicious. Is it though, Jacob? Is it? He's still around, so I guess it's not that bad. Uh, the truth is, it, it is you can't tell. Yeah. In fact, everyone who tastes it says it's very clean, very clear, and again, better than a lot of our American drinking water. You can't tell, um, but you know. <laughs> That's I'm the sure problem. All, yeah, you just know where it's coming from. Um, what about the timeline here? When is this actually happening? So California still has some red tape to cut through here, another six to nine months on the regulation end. And then you could see major facilities constructed. Those would take six to seven years. But there are some large metros who have already got the ball rolling. As I said, Orange County for the last like 15 years has been basically doing this. They would basically be able to fast track it. Uh, San Diego and Los Angeles doing it too. And again, proponents say, remember, all water on this earth is recycled water. It's too bad we can't have a holiday cheers with some poo water. No offense. <laughs> I just so happy. No, I'm just kidding. Poo on TV. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. NBC covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it's tough to read, to watch, or to listen to all of them, our international teams have done it for you. Here are some things that they're keeping an eye on in a segment that we call The Global. In Zimbabwe, at least 100 elephants are now dead amidst a serious drought in the country's largest national park. A grim sign of climate change. Conservation is saying uh, blaming the El Nino weather phenomenon for drying up the park's watering holes, forcing the elephants to rely on man-made water sources. Authorities now fear a repeat of 2019 when more than 200 elephants died in a severe drought in Zimbabwe. In Turkey, the country's soccer leagues resumed playing today, ending a suspension after a brutal attack on a referee. One team's president punched and kicked the official after a game last week, sending him to the hospital. The attacker has since been arrested and his team fined almost $70,000. In Germany, the train drivers union voted to go on strike after disputes with the nation's rail company. The union is calling for pay increases to keep up with inflation and reduced work hours. That strike is set to begin in the new year. All right, coming up, a stunning New York Times investigation finding that thousands of young kids are doing one of the most dangerous jobs in America. I'll go one-on-one -on -one with the reporter behind the story coming up next. All right, it's time to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. Across the country, thousands of young children are doing one of the most dangerous jobs in this country, roofing. That's according to the New York Times investigation. Children, some as young as elementary school, tell the Times they're waking up before dawn, carrying heavy bundles of shingles that leave their arms shaking and working through heat waves on black tar roofs that burn their hands. And one slip could be deadly. It is important to note these are jobs children should not be doing in the first place. It's against federal law for anyone under the age of 18 to work in roofing because it is so dangerous. But for migrant children coming into this country, often without their parents, it is a job that is in high demand and it pays well. That's what teachers, social workers, labor organizers, and federal investigators are telling The Times. The Times spoke to more than 100 kids working these jobs, kids like Juan Sario in New Orleans, who says he's been replacing roofs and working 12-hour shifts almost every day since he came to the U.S. from Guatemala four years ago. He told them he'd like to go to school or at least join a soccer team, but he can't because he has to work and he has to pay the rent. Hannah Dreyer is one of the reporters who worked in the story. She's an investigative reporter for The New York Times, and she is joining us now. This is incredible to even think about. So I'm thankful that you brought this investigative piece to us. Um, you spoke to a lot of different roofing teams 
a lot of different kids that are working these jobs, a lot of people in this situation. One of the people that you spoke with from a roofing team essentially told you they cannot turn people away. They don't want to turn these underage kids away because they feel like they're in need. I mean, it's a really shocking thing. Here in this country, there are child roofers, a category that is not supposed to exist. Yeah. All over the country, we found more than 100 kids in almost two dozen states, and they're here on their own. So they're not working an after-school job or working because they want to. They're working because they're really on the hook to make money, just like an adult. Some of them are working 12-hour days and getting paid, you know, $70 for one of the most dangerous jobs in this country. You talked to Anthony Padilla, who's been doing this. Um, he fell almost 30 feet from a roof onto cement blacktop, onto cement ground. He can finds it hard to even do some basic tasks today, and he's no longer able to work. How did you find out about him? How did you find out about his story? What did he tell you? You know, child labor laws are really here so that children are protected from things like this. They're not so the kids stay in school as much as about protecting children's safety. And so roofing is one of these occupations where children are falling sometimes to their deaths because it's just so dangerous. Anthony is one of many children who didn't die when he fell, but he was severely injured. Does he have brain injuries? He's brain damaged. Half of his body really doesn't work. Oh gosh. This is a kid who was 14 when he came here. He was 15 when he fell. And now he spends most of his days in a trailer, sitting on his bed, looking at TikTok videos of other roofers, not really able to speak or communicate. And he's undocumented, so he can't really have any repercussions. He can't go after anybody or sue anybody for his injuries. I mean, he tried to get a workers' comp case. There were three contractors. They were all responsible. And they basically spent a year fighting about who should be on the hook for this 15-year-old's injury. He's gotten almost no medical care. You have spoken to a lot of people that are in this situation, not just roofing, other dangerous jobs as well for migrant children. Has any of these practices changed? Has it moved the needle at all for protecting kids? like this? I mean, we are seeing a wave of migrant child labor in this country. Nearly 400,000 children have come across the border just since 2021 without their parents. They're here alone, and a lot of them are working jobs in factories. They're in slaughterhouses overnight. They're making household brands. And the Department of Labor has said that they're going to start cracking down on this abusive practice. But what we're seeing is more and more kids are coming and more and more kids are working. So troubling. Hannah Dreyer, really important stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Still to come, what happens when a major studio splits with one of its main actors? We're talking about Marvel's next move. Coming up next. All right, that's a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.